So, why would you come to Melbourne University? Uh, I'll, go, I'll go through some of this stuff because you have to. Uh, th there's all these different um, rankings out there. Uh, the, what is it, the QS World University Ranking says that we're the best university in Australia and the 27th best in the world. There are other rankings out there that might say slightly differently, so we'll use this one for, for Melbourne <laughs> University today. Now, um, <clears throat> why, would we use, uh, why would you come to Melbourne University as well? It's a higher level qualification that's recognised globally. Well, it is recognised globally and we think it's good. I think it's good and it's excellent. Uh, uh, and. Uh, we do a great deal of work and many of our graduates go to wonderful, wonderful jobs all around the world, I can guarantee that. Now, um, getting into some more content, come in, come in, plenty of room, there's oh, not many seats left, but um, sorry to let you see this so small today, actually it's the same size every day, but um, <laughs> <laughs> come in. Come down the sides, you can even come right down here if you want. So, uh, why don't you come to Melbourne University? Will you be inspired by world leading researchers? I know some of them, myself, uh, who are terrific engineering academics. They do top work with lots of top industries and government all around the world. Uh, we are a very industry connected university. An interesting result is that in global rankings, Melbourne University produces graduates that are considered what is the seventh most employable <coughs> in the world. Which I think is quite a remarkable result. Uh, uh, and certainly, uh, considering there are hundreds and hundreds of universities globally, um, you know, that, that's a good thing. Um, our degree is, of course, internationally recognised. So there's something called the Washington Accord, which I won't go into the details of, but Engineers Australia, which is the um, Professional Association representing engineers in Australia. I'm a fellow of Engineers Australia myself. Uh, uh, said, well, this is what we want to see in degrees for them to be considered an international standing. We, of course, have that as well as other universities. But once you are part of that accreditation process, you are through the Washington Accord and then for that Melbourne University engineering graduate is formally recognised in the United States or China or the European Union or India or Africa or anywhere else as a professional engineer. Okay? And then there's another uh, uh, equivalent kind of accreditation called URACE. I don't know what the full acronym, acronym means, but EU gives it away. It's, it's, it's an equivalent uh, international recognition uh, through the European Union and we have that and I think I'm not sure how many Australian universities have that accreditation. I think relatively few. Might, we might be the only one, but I'm not sure. Um, many of you will know now uh, uh, the, the Melbourne way of teaching engineers is a bit different to the way other uh, engineering schools teach. We have this 3 plus 2 or 3 plus 3, depending on your pathway. First three years, either in a Bachelor of Science or Biomedicine or Design, and then into the Master's degree. And, and that's got many benefits, <coughs> particularly around flexibility. And I, I think it's a very attractive thing for, for those of you in year 11 and 12, or year 10 or wherever, you're thinking to yourself, well, I like maths, I like physics, I like science, but I also like language. So you can, that, that, that allows you to think, well, do I, want to, do I want to not do a language at university? Maybe I want to do a bit of both. Uh, more importantly, you might be saying to yourself, look, I don't know if I want to be a doctor or I want to be an engineer, or I don't know if I want to be a physicist or a chemist or an engineer yet. Because there's a lot of overlap in the kinds of skills and, and interests that, 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 that students will, will share as you go through into university. And it's indeed a very normal part of life, and many of you get through when you, you know, well out of graduation, so I think, I really want to be what I'm currently doing, I might want to go do something else as well. So, so but, but maintaining that flexibility and being able to choose between various forms of science and various forms of engineering, or biomedicine or others, is a really important feature because, it, because having flexibility, the ability to learn different things, the ability to keep your options open, particularly for the first couple of years of your university studies, is a tremendously important part of your development. You know, it, 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 it would be silly to assume that you know that you want to be a mechanical engineer at age 16 and then at age 18 you're going to go off and be a mechanical engineer. 
I started electrical engineering at this university and computer science a long time ago. I ended up doing a physics degree and a mechanical engineering degree. Right? So, so that's a very normal part of your growth as a, as a person. Flexibility is a key thing. Now, I'm going to talk specifically about net engine aero and, and uh, uh, mechatronics now. So, so why would you do those three uh, degrees at Melbourne University? Four things that we can do here, of course, no surprise. Well, I'll talk a little bit more detail about mechatronics in particular. Some of you may not know what that is. There's a, there's a robot arm, there's an artificial leg, there's a bottom half of a head in an aeroplane, leading to um, suggestions that these different qualifications can lead you to specialise more or less in each of those. So what is mechanical engineering? That's, the, that's probably the easiest one to define. Mechanical engineers design, construct, operate and maintain machines, robots, energy systems and manufacturing equipment. I'd, I'd almost stop at machines in that definition. Mechanical engineers design, construct, operate and maintain machines. Now, what's a machine? Well, a machine, in, in the broadest sense, is a, is a very complicated, very nuanced thing to, to define. You could say a computer is a machine, or a microprocessor, or the national electricity grid is a machine. If you specialise in the power flows of the natural, the natural electricity grid, that's power systems engineering, that's not mechanical engineering. But, but you know, looking at, for example, um, clearly cars, wind turbines or robots, that's pretty obvious. You know? Well, a wind turbine makes electricity, but it turns wind via blades into electricity through a big gearbox, typically, and, a, and an electrical generator. So, so a wind turbine is not exclusively a mechanical engineering problem, but an enormous part of it is. You think of the aerodynamics of the blades. Uh, funnily enough, mechanical engineers study that, and I'll talk about that in a moment. You've got the blade design, and you understand how that wind turns uh, through blade motion into mechanical power, that is the sharp spinning. That's certainly all mechanical engineering. If that blade starts to wobble, and buzz, and various things called flutter, you'll come to understand this in mechanical engineering, or the whole uh, 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 pylon on which the turbine sits itself moves back and forth. They can fail. So understanding the dynamics of how those machines um, vibrate and respond to wind speeding up and slowing down, and we know all about that today, uh, uh, is an important part of understanding the design of a wind turbine That's a mechanical engineering problem. So you can see tremendous amount of mechanical engineering and structural engineering, civil engineering in a, in a wind turbine, but also power systems engineering or electrical engineering. Um, cars, no surprises here, it, it's clearly a machine. But a mobile phone or a gaming console, well, well, um, <coughs> if you're looking at um, uh, a mobile phone, yes, of course, there's a tremendous amount of software and, and electronics and microprocessing and all that very sophisticated, non-traditional mechanical engineering in it. But what about understanding how you design the whole thing? How about if you drop the mobile phone? How about if you're trying to work out what's the best way to design it so that people don't get repetitive strain injury? Yeah. So, so even in a device like a mobile phone or a computer, there is a lot of understanding of the mechanics, the loads, the forces, what, what, what the human body is able to do, is informs the design of a mobile phone. Understanding, in that sense, probably the human as a machine and how it interfaces with uh, another machine, a mobile phone. Now you can see in all that sort of stuff, Lots of maths, lots of physics. And this young man is standing in, in the intake of a turned off wind tunnel. I hope it's a turned off wind tunnel for his sake. Uh, and uh, he's a fellow who finished here a year or two ago and now works at Boeing. Boeing and Fisherman's Bend here make uh, a lot of the control surfaces for Boeing aircraft. Uh, the 787, which is, you know, the wonderful aircraft that I two weeks ago got non-stop from London to Perth. Uh, amazing thing. Uh, that the, the control services on that aircraft were made in Melbourne by young people like James. Okay, what is mechatronics? Well, mechatronics, well, the mobile phone's an example of it and computers and other things. It's, it's 
it's, a, it's an interplay between mechanical software and electrical engineering. Okay? So if you've got you know, many devices, now this, there's a, a bright young person controlling a drone, so once again you've got those airfoils and things up and down, an aerospace engineer or mechanical engineer could look at that, but there's an awful, awful lot of smarts on there as well. Uh, uh, so where does the mechanical system end and the electrical system or the software system start? And the, and the reality is, if it's your dishwasher at home or it's your car, that's now blurred in many cases. Mecha what were traditionally mechanical devices, your mums and dads in the room here, were their first car when they got it, it was a mechanical device. There was a little bit of electrical stuff in it, you know, a battery and an alternator and start the engine, maybe an eager if you were lucky, but, but certainly often not an air conditioner. Whereas now, uh, the, number, the amount of computational power in a car <coughs> is a very, very different thing. Adaptive cruise control, all the safety systems, anti-skid, you know, ABS, the engine controller itself, all this stuff. There's an awful lot of computation in the car. So, so we started this degree now, probably 20 years ago. We were the first university in Australia that started a controller's pathway. And uh, it looks at this integrated study of mechanical, software, and electrical systems, particularly for things that are smart. Um, then, of course, there's aerospace engineering. And I just want to, we, we, we're starting a new offering in 2019 to really target this um, um, group of students who really want to be aerospace engineers. So, so but I do want to bring out something which is a tremendous amount of commonality between mechanical and aerospace engineering. If you look at what we study in mechanical engineering and what we study in, what we study in aerospace engineering, First one, the most important, the foundation stuff is mathematics and science, physics in particular. Okay. Uh, now, mechatronics studies that as well, as indeed uh, do all parts of engineering. Thermodynamics slash propulsion. That's actually my area of research. It's teaching. Uh, you might not think so. What's thermodynamics? Do anyone know what thermodynamics is? It sounds. It sounds. Plus, my kids think it sounds so sort of weird. Yeah. It's like um, heat and temperature. Correct, correct. So, the one liner is it's the science of energy, the study of energy. Okay? And, uh, but, but in, in mechanical engineers, mechanical engineering, you might study the science of energy applied to, for example, uh, an engine in a car or a gas turbine making electricity or a nuclear power station or indeed other forms of power generation. Uh, not so much thermodynamic principles apply to a wind turbine, although they are, you can apply to solar panels quite a lot. But obviously, if you're looking at gas turbine propulsion, not gas turbine power generation, then you're tending to look at aerospace applications. So the same science, same principles apply to stationary forms of power generation or mobile forms of power generation. And if some of those are in the air, we call it aerospace engineering. Okay? But exactly the same kind of stuff. Mechanical engineers study fluid dynamics, the motion of fluids. Aerospace engineers study aerodynamics. Now there are two common fluids that we deal with, air and water. And aer aerodynamicists Aerospace engineers study primarily air motion, but the actual the equations, the science is is essentially the same. Dynamics and control. We've showed that picture of that drone <coughs> before. There's all sorts of understanding how that thing moves through space, and then how you control it. Well, if that was my car, it wouldn't be an aerospace engineering problem. If it was a drone or an aircraft, it's an aerospace engineering problem. Solar mechanics. If I get a stick bend it and it breaks. I've got to understand the stresses in that thing and how it responds to loads. If that was instead of a stick or a concrete beam, if it was a wing and I bent it, I'd be doing aerospace engineering. And guess what? If it bend wings hard enough, they break too, just like beams and columns. Uh, manufacturing and design, extraordinary uh, uh, aerospace design being done down the road at Boeing. Uh, but Many manufacturing principles are shared once again between these two. 
and then and no surprises there for the materials and aircraft materials, particularly carbon fibre, which is a huge thing now in aerospace. There's lots of overlap, so much so that uh, as, a, as a background to, to my, own, my own experience, I did mechanical engineering here a long time ago. And after I did mechanical engineering here, I went to work for a company called ICI, which is now called Orica, as a mechanical design engineer. Then I did my PhD in the United Kingdom, sponsored by Rolls-Royce, who makes aircraft engines on aircraft engine design. And then I went to the United States, did more research in the United States, working for uh, Northrop Grumman and Pratt Whitney, who make aircraft <coughs> engines as well. And then I came back to Australia and I've continued to do some aerospace-related work, but work mainly in uh, uh, energy, power generation, and also in the automotive sector. Now I'm a mechanical engineer. Uh, and I continue to work with my colleagues with mechanical engineering companies, but also aerospace engineering companies as well. So there's a lot of overlap between the two. So uh, mechanical versus mechatronics. Uh, once again, fundamental maths and science, thermopropulsion, fluids, dynamics and control. What you will find with um, uh, mechatronics is greater emphasis on the dynamics and control part of that problem than in, for example, thermodynamics or fluid dynamics. So that we can finish you off. You can't study everything for over five years. You've, you've, got, to you've got to cut it off at some stage. But, but obviously, when you're looking at robots, when you're looking at drones, when you're looking at various controlled electromechanical systems. It's the dynamics and control that's really key. But once again, all of those things studied again. Now, uh, industry and employability. So I'll, I'll try and finish in about five minutes and then you'll have some questions and answers. Uh, industry and employability. So at this university, you can do internships, you can do 10 to 15 weeks of professional work experience, and you're doing that, so satisfactory, satisfactorily completing that, is credited towards your degree. Uh, we also do, in addition to internships, you can do several subjects and other programs which, with, 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 with which you engage with industry. For example, a very common thing in the final year is about a, qu a, a quarter of your final year will be spent doing an industry project, and can be spent doing an industry project. And you might, for example, work full-time down in a company doing that project. That's in addition to your internship. So you could spend, for example, a whole summer working in a company. Some of our students do that whole summer working in a company and then continue on in that company for their industry project in their final year. So they can do a tremendous amount of work placement-based learning on site. Other students choose not to do quite so much and they might do it in a different way. But if you really want to do a lot of placement-based learning, you can. But there's also other stuff. There's a subject called Creative Innovative Engineering, which solves industry problems. Bio-design innovation, which I don't know a lot about, I must admit, because I'm not a bio person, but there'll be people across the road who can help you with that. And then also STEM mentoring program. You all know what STEM is by now, I assume. You get STEMed at school all the time, I'm guessing. <laughs> yeah, we're going to STEM you some more here. So, so uh, STEM, 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 STEM. Um, but but you know, it's really simple. If you go and do good work, guess what? Here's a trick to getting a good job, right? You, you, you do good work, you, you, be, you be polite, and you be nice, and you turn up on time, and they usually, at the end of it, go, this is pretty good, we might offer a job, right? Not, 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 not mystical, okay? And and just we, we, we carefully work with the students to make sure you do good projects, interesting stuff, academically appropriate stuff, but also stuff that the that the industry partner really values. And at the end of that, if you do a good piece of work, it really helps you. It also helps you understand that that the, the world of work is not some mystical thing that, that is fundamentally any different to anything else. Just like at school, if you turn up and hand in your homework and you do what the teacher says, you know, and, you, and you're a good, good student, you don't cause too much trouble, right? right? Employers want to see people who are just, you know, organised, professional, work hard, and complete stuff in a timely manner. It's not rocket science. And uh, 
our, our programs help us help help students lead students through that. Then there's also lots of other stuff, clubs and societies, all sorts of other things. Engineers Without Borders (EWB), which is a wonderful thing where students can go all around the world helping um, build stuff. Uh, Robo Gales is another wonderful program. It was started by a Melbourne University student. I actually taught her 15. Marita Chang, I taught her about 15 years ago, or rather I lectured her, she, she's pretty smart, she taught herself most things, but, um, but, but that's a wonderful, wonderful program. Um, employment outcomes, I mentioned before, uh, this university is ranked number seven in the world for graduate employability, which is quite a remarkable achievement, I think. Um, uh, within four months of graduation, 93% of our students are employed. Now, now, the other seven percent is a good question. What are they doing? Well, um, more often than not, they're training because <coughs> they're tired and they're finished a five-year degree. Um, but but very good employment outcomes for our students. I'm not going to go too much into these details because I want to be I want to take questions from you guys. Um, the, these graphs I'll mention briefly. But, but this is not particular to mechanical engineering because you'll show, I'll, I'll skip through aerospace and mechatronics as well. But you can just see this extraordinary diversity of employment destinations for our students. So students come in, for example, do the Bachelor of Design, Bachelor of Science, then do one of these three master's degrees, uh, mechanical, mechanical aerospace, and mechanical business. These are the industries where we currently employ our students. We don't call it, the employers take it. Uh, aeronautics, automotive, biomechanics, manufacturing, minerals and energy, power generation, robotics, transport. And they're the examples of companies. You can see Bank, our ANZ, that's good. Banks are doing really well. I don't know if that is. They won't work for a bank. No, so they probably don't employ enough engineers, that's probably their problem. But um, uh, Arab, a very famous consulting engineering firm. What's the most famous job that Arab's ever done in Australia? Anyone know? One of the less young people in my room, I know. What was that? Well, the famous one was the Sydney Opera House. Uh, uh, BAE, which was called British Aerospace. British Aerospace, it was called. Uh, BAE now making aircraft and for civilian and defence purposes. Uh, Boeing, of course. Bosch, big German manufacturer of many things, many things. You know, from drills through to automotive control units. The Boston Consulting Group, that's a consulting firm in, in Cold Street. Carbon Revolution, Dan and Geelong made carbon fibre components. Remarkable story, um, uh, Melbourne, Melbourne, or I should say Victorian story, it's a Geelong story. Syro, Deloitte, DST, ExxonMobil, Ford, Honeywell, Leica, uh, Pricewaterhouse Coopers, Siemens. Another big German manufacturer, Yarra Trams, Trams. And you can see the kinds of roles that our students are doing. Now, if I just literally flashed through the other ones, there's mechatronics. You're seeing very similar diversity. Um, I will briefly mention graduate degree packages because that's a new thing. Uh, and then I'll go to take questions. So um, a new offering, graduate degree packages, new offering for high achieving students to apply up front for both, both a bachelor degree and a master of engineering through VTAC. So you can do both at once. Um, guarantees a Commonwealth supported place. That is the cheap version of doing the university degree that most of you hope to get uh, into the master of engineering if you pass your undergraduate degree. Uh, master of engineering GDPs, graduate degree packages. Bachelor of biomedicine, master of engineering, bachelor of design, master of engineering, bachelor of science, master of engineering. That's our three plus two. So the three year bachelor degree plus a two year master of engineering. The graduate degree package in commerce and engineering is a three plus three. And the reason for that is that, comp and it's a wonderful degree to do, by the way, or combined or two, two degrees to do, uh, the Bachelor of Commerce quite obviously doesn't share this, quite as much commonality as a Bachelor of Science with engineering. So for example, more physics, more mathematics, you'll be doing a lot of economics, marketing, finance, and so on and so forth in the Bachelor of Commerce. So there's a little bit more that we have to give you in the Master of Engineering in order to compensate for that. But having said that, uh, 
an overall qualification, a Bachelor of Commerce and Master Engineering is an extraordinarily powerful qualification uh, because when you go into industry, being able to formulate your engineering assessments in terms of the language of business, that is dollars and cents, is a really important skill. And you know, many engineers will go off and do an MBA or something years after they've gone into industry because they recognise that that financial literacy is an important part of a, of a career. Now, <clears throat> essentially, if you get an ATAR of 96 or above, you can apply uh, for a GDP um, <clears throat> through VTAC. If you don't, you can go through and do the Bachelor of Science or the Bachelor of Commerce or the Bachelor of Biomedicine or some other undergraduate degree, and provided you get a weighted average mark of 65% or above, you'll get into the Master of Engineering anyway. Okay? Now, now um, the vast majority, in fact, until before GDPs were created, the, the only way for CSP students to go into the Master of Engineering was with this 65 average going into the Master of Engineering. And as I mentioned before about being a good uh, 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 prospective employee, being a good prospective university student, if you turn up, you do the work, uh, you know, and just work diligently throughout. You will get a, you will get that kind of mark or above. You know, it, it's not, it's not that hard to get a sixty-five percent or above, eighty percent or above first-class honours. And if you turn up and do your work and you're diligent throughout, you will get sixty-five or above. 